So look, I guess a bunch of animal health issues and we'll, and we'll go through these pretty quickly. Um, and again, please stop us for questions, but we've already talked about heat and humidity stress to a degree. This can also feed into acidosis at time, which is a bit paradoxical when we're, when we're when, again, there's lots of forage often available. But what we often find is, is, is that, that although there's a lot of feed on offer, um, cattle and particularly really fresh cows or cows that might be on a higher level of grain will often fill, fill out really nicely in the dairy. But if the conditions are ordinary um, from a heat and humidity perspective, what they'll often do is just eat a little bit out in the paddock and not actually balance as you would expect their forage intake to meet their, their concentrate intake. So we actually can run into some significant acidosis risk issues at this time of year as well that we often you know, aren't necessarily expecting. Um, we've touched on some of these basics on, on heat stress management. And again, the early milking, high quality forage near shade if cattle have given up on eating, water, water everywhere to drink. You know, these cattle are likely to be looking for 150 to 200 litres of water a day. And where possible having water in every paddock is, is critical. That's a more in, major infrastructure issue. Um, sprinkler, shade, fence, dairy, fertility focus and, and forage quality. And again, the concentrate management is important as well. We talk about mastitis, okay? Lots of issues here that we just need to keep thinking about. You know, milking machine function, absolutely critical that it's paramount. We often think, you know, if you think about mastitis and mastitis risk, it's a bit like having, you know, a set of tyres on your car. If you've got bald tyres, everything's fine when it's dry, okay? But, but if, if conditions get wet and you've got bald tyres, you're going to run in all sorts of problems. And quite often our mastitis risk, all those little things that we were getting away with when, when it was dry, go pear-shaped in, in wet weather and, and, and mud. So I guess it's a critical time to make sure that our, our milking machine function is spot on. We should make sure that our milking liners and our cup liners are up to date. And again, we were on a farm the other day where when we actually look back at how long it had been since they've been changed, it had been um, over three and a half thousand milkings, because again, they were locked into a traditional mode of thinking it was every six months that they needed to change. But when you looked at the recommendations on the liners, it actually came back on that farm because the herd size had expanded to only every four months. A lot of people will be washing udders at this time and washing teats, okay, prior to milking. If you wash teats, it is critical to dry them, okay, because if you don't dry the teat end after you've washed it, you're going to have a little drop of water that's full of manure and bacteria at the end of the teat end. The cup goes on, a bit of negative vacuum pressure, that drop of water gets sucked up into the teat end. We've got a really high risk of that causing mastitis in those cows. So if you are washing udders, critical that we talk about wiping that teat so it's dry when you put um, the cups on. Not the whole udder, it doesn't need to be dry, but the teat end does. We talk a little bit sometimes about pre-dipping, which is using um, teat dip before the cups go on. And again, if there's a time where that is viable, it is probably at those times where we have very high environmental challenge. Um, getting cows away from mud as quickly as possible or if possible after milking and watching out for hot spots on your farm like muddy crossing, laneways, feed pads and water troughs like the one on the left. You know, if we have water troughs like this in the wet, they are going to be an absolute magnet for cows to hang around. And these are real hot spots, I guess, for mastitis and mastitis risk as we go into summer. Um, and again, the time to generally work on things like this is when it's dry, but you know, even when it's wet at times like this, you know, if we can fill in holes like this around troughs, really, really beneficial at reducing our mastitis risk. Teat dipping, um, absolutely critical that we're using effective teat dips. And again, there's a lot of people that are, that, that are using teat dip, either not using enough of it, um, not getting good volume or cover on the teat end. And again, quite often what we've seen, particularly when we have problems with water supply, is people that are mixing teat dip on farm, quite often there can be problems with the sterility of that water that's being used. So again, getting your milking text to check the efficacy and the sterility of your teat dip is really, really important. And again, it's a good time as well to be making sure that we've got those high risk cows with teat ends below their hocks or repeat cases, or cows that just run a lot of milk, okay? Good time to be reviewing those for culling because our cull prices are still excellent. And quite often those high cost, high risk cows are often better off in a truck rather than causing repeat cases of mastitis. It's amazing when you go through these herds that have got lots of hoppy cows, how many of those cows that are, that are mastitis from cases that are actually repeat cases um, um, in herds. So, you know, having a good look and, and a good hard review for the potential for culling is worthwhile. 
Um, okay, look, lameness, big issue again at the moment to think about. And again, here's you know, a really nice herd of cows, laneways that are generally very well maintained, but you can see, and we'll watch the cows here, what they're doing, okay? Very reluctant to walk here, okay? And again, what's happened with the rain that's occurred is that all that cover that you get from a bit of manure has disappeared and it just leaves stones, okay? And these become real hot spots for, for causing soft feet. All right, so lameness, one of our big issues, but you know, doing something where we can like this to just try and help with this laneway footing at these times, you know, really, really beneficial. And again, the best time to maintain laneways again is when it's dry. One of the key things that we see is, is build up over time of channels beside here and no, no drainage to the paddocks next door. So again, when conditions are dry, making sure your laneways can drain water away to the paddocks rather than building up a bit of a, a, a levee bank along the side here will really help with getting water off those laneways. So again, the basics of lameness at the moment, correct bad feet before they come lame. Okay, because we know again, it's a bit like the bald tire situation. If the cows have got bad feet going into wet weather, bad feet will become lame feet. If you do get lame cows, treat them quickly, make sure that the foot's picked up if you can, do the corrective trimming, use your blocks and minimise walking, okay? Because the last thing cows need when they're lame is to be walked three kilometres with the herd. It's really important if the cows are slowed down, keep them in a paddock near the dairy and make sure they've got plenty of feed in that paddock. And again, use your medications if required. Good time of year, again, for, for foot barbs, um, I guess, Technically speaking, you know, there's, there's mixed data on the efficacy of foot baths. We know that probably the only thing that effectively hardens feet is formalin. Copper sulfate, zinc sulfate, certainly good for reducing infection, but have a lesser effect on actually hardening the foot. But if you're going to use formalin, you have to make sure that you, you've got well-constructed troughs. They're well away from the dairy and downwind because we know that there are some, some human health risks associated with use of formalin. Okay, but it is quite effective at, at hardening feet. We've touched on the laneways. Long-term diets that address acidosis prevention, have biotin in place and zinc in place. Putting those in now, not gonna have any impact. These are long-term things that you just have to have in your diets to make sure we are um, preventing lameness. And the final thing is that if conditions are crappy, you've just gotta be careful with stock. You know, Handle your stock carefully, slowly, and, and patiently and just let the cows work their way back to the dairy. And it can be very frustrating with staff, but it's stuff that if you have employed staff, you need to continually go through is they just have to be patient with the cattle when conditions are like this. Okay, biting flies, certainly an issue um, up in your area. Apparently there's not a lot of buffalo fly up there at the moment. But again, this is just a nice little video I like to run. You know, this is the herd near us. This is a herd of springers. And I guess there's two critical, three things here that you can see that are probably wrong with this situation. Okay. Um, firstly, we've got no real good shade in this paddock. Secondly, we've got a bog hole around the, uh, around the water. Okay. And thirdly, these cows are getting absolutely carnage from biting flies. Okay. And the biting flies, they cause major issues with cow comfort, but they are also a significant increase in risk with respect to lameness, um, with respect to mastitis, and also a significant risk with respect to, to gut function and acidosis, because the cows, if they don't sit, and they won't sit because they're getting chewed by flies, they are much more prone to digestive upsets as well. Okay, so look, any, any comments on any of the preceding slides that people want to ask questions on? Um, I guess the update on three days is that there's none been reported at this stage. It's expected to come through, but at this stage, talking to the local land surface vets through the Hunter and the Mid North Coast, we haven't seen any reports of three day at this point in time. The only thing I want to touch on is on the previous slide with laneways and so forth, and um, it's a great photo you got there with the wood chips down there to try and minimise mud and so forth. Um, if you contact local arborists and so forth, quite often they're quite desperate to get rid of that free of charge and I'll deliver it free for you. So it's great to sort of get in contact with those guys and sort of put your name down to be able to get some wood chips for times like these. And they're very quick and easy to put down and it does reduce your mud, definitely. Uh, excellent, Warren. And I guess the, the, the if you've got a well-formed laneway underneath, it makes a big difference because you've got a crown to put it on rather than a pit. I guess the, if you can't get 
wood chip, and we've had some issues with supply of wood chip in the mid north coast. One of the options that we've seen taken, and I know, I know Leo and Luke have done this in the past, is some of the really low quality silage bales that we make or clean up paddocks of rubbishy summer forage. We can actually roll those out on laneways as well to give us some improvement in surface. And again, these can be rolled out specifically in hot spots, you know, where, where we might have a creek crossing or, or a little bit of a hill where, you know, we know that there's stones and the cows jack up from going through that. And that low quality roughage that, that you know, you're looking for something to do with, you know, a, a bit of a laneway cover, it can actually do a really, really good job. Look, I guess another comment, and this is a young stock issue. We've got conditions that are that are incredibly favourable now to, to parasites on pasture. Okay, now this can be an impact in, in both the milking herd, but importantly, you know, I think to anyone that's that's out on farm working with farmers and to the farmers in the group, um, just being aware of, of parasite risk at the moment is very, very important. Like we are going to see big accumulations of some of our intestinal worms. Conditions like this. Um, are very favourable to, to, to barber's pole worm, okay, which again we've seen cause um, deaths due to anemia, an, anemia in young stock in the past. The other thing that we need to be really aware of is that we've had a lot of years of using now very single active or single use, um, single active agent backline treatments in some of those calves um, and calf trenching programs. We know that we now have significant resistance building up to some of those. And I think it's, it's, it's important that we start reviewing some of the, the anthelmintic or the drench use, particularly in young stock, because we are seeing significant resistance develop, uh, particularly to one of the worms called Capuria. And we do now have some effective uh, multi-drug or, or combination treatments available. Some of those are listed below, um, that are certainly available for, for use on farm now. And again, it's important that, that we are aware that these have got milk withholding periods that are significant sometimes, and that needs to be checked um, before using them on, on, on mature cattle. Um, and, and there's some constraints with, with animal size, particularly with the trifecta product, you can't use that on cattle under 100 kilos. But I think having a look at some of these different combination drenches as part of your rotation program um, to help take out some of these resistant parasites is very, very something that I think we should be thinking about as we move forward. All right, I think we've got there. Um, we've got three minutes, Carly, based on what we said. Um, Josh, we haven't quite got to those extra slides. I can, I can whack them up. While you're grabbing Sorry. those, Neil, I might just let everyone know that we do have a field day in Tare on the 9th of February and in Tokal on the 10th of February, which will cover um, similar topics and expanding at um, those local levels as well. If you're, you're if you're interested, either contact myself or jump onto Dairy Australia events um, page and um, search for those on the 9th and 10th of February. Well, these are the things when a farmer rings me and says, can I start planting ryegrass or can I plant now? Is um, I always talk to them about really focus on these these four things. So, you know, light is just as important as any of these others. Nutrients important, moisture and temperature. Um, so, and, and often light gets forgot about. Like I've seen guys going on and, um, you know, it's in Tari, I've seen it plenty of times as well that we get kikuyu growth going bananas. People go and put ryegrass in, then they mulch all the kikuyu mm -hmm. over the top of it. Um, and that's okay if it's, you know, if it's an inch of mulch, but I've seen, you know, nearly a foot of mulch put it put on top of it and um, if that seedling can't see light it can't grow its own energy so it's going to die so it needs mm. to be able to see the light and you know temperature is really important um, again you know 10 to 20 day post planting it's really important moisture and nutrients if you can tick all these boxes you know um, have a crack at it if, 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 if it's all there so really think of those four things now that's that's great Justin we saw some great I captured some great photos seven or eight years ago from Leo and Luke's where yeah. they'd um, mown and mulched and, and, and cleaned up paddocks and raked them, I think, or slashed them and raked them. And we had these wonderful lines where, because they, they, they couldn't get that, that trash off those paddocks and those lines. And wherever the lines were, we ended up with no pasture. But where we'd taken that trash away, we just had stunning germination. Um, it was, they're, they're really good photos. So yeah, but... Um, it was a really good example of that. And we actually know that, that, that there's some interesting work from, from New Zealand where 
they looked at Kaikuyu trash and they, they used it as a as a, a tea. So they soaked Kaikuyu trash in water and then they, they looked at inoculating or, or germinating seed in, in clean water compared to this Kaikuyu tea. And the actual, the, the stuff that was coming up in the Kaikuyu tea or the trash tea had, had substantially lower germination rate and much lower seedling vigor. So there's actually quite a few substances secreted by this rotting vegetation that, that can actually impact um, seed germination. So too much trash can be problematic both for physical reasons, but also because of chemical reasons as well. Um, this is some of your treated and untreated stuff, Josh. This is what we see, it's, you know, the difference between treated and untreated. Um, it's not just insects, as you know, Pete and me talk about all the time. It's, it's usually four or five things that'll, that'll um, build up to a failure. Um, and, um, you know, typically that's moisture, insect pressure, temperature, um, and light, like I said before, that will cause. So if you can put treated seed in and account for some of these things, and, and we know that the treated seed also has a, a bit of a, um, a bit of a shot at helping it um, give it a bit more vigor um, outside of the, the insecticide control, um, gives you as well. So, and, you know, even in the CoQ stuff, if you're not spraying out, um, we've seen benefits in treated seed in the CoQ as well. Mm -hmm. That's actually at Sam's, that photo there. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. Okay. Peter Beale, did you want to... Um... Oh, just to thank mate. you, Neil. Thank you, Neil. Thanks for um, what we're doing. It's good to have that good discussion and... Um, Obviously, these guys have got a lot to offer. We will be doing them again, and it's really um, just feedback from you to Carly, please, in terms of do you appreciate it? Is, is this worthwhile? And because um, we'd like to keep it going. But yeah, I just thanks to Carly for organising it. Thanks, Neil and Kyle and and Josh putting their time in. It's um, good advice, and and just everybody else for contributing. So um, that's my main message. Neil, well done. Excellent. Now we even we even stuck the time, I think. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, all oh, the best of luck, everyone. It's going to be a, a, a. I think the seasons like this give us wonderful opportunities, but they're not without their challenges. Um, and and I guess it's a. Uh, it's yeah. We'd, we'd love to say make high, hay when the sun shines. <laughs> I think it's just make whatever you can whenever you get a bloody chance. I think so. <laughs> um, thank you. All the best, and um, yeah, we'll catch up with you all shortly.